with the coming of spring, we move right from flu season to allergy season. Allergies, nothing to sneeze at, tonight on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. As the snow finally melts and the temperatures slowly rise, we are beginning to think of the spring allergy season when everything is blooming and the air is full of pollen. But there are many other allergens that we encounter each day. First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. True or false? Nasal washes cleanse allergens and irritants from the nose. True or false? Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, The Picture of Health. Each of my essays originally written for the show comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We'll announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your quiz question quiz answer in. We answer your questions about allergy uh, as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Well, joining us tonight are two great friends. I think they've both been on the show, what, 20, 30, 40,000 times each? <laughs> Dr. Tom Luzier of Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy and Dr. Mark Bubach from the Dakota Allergy and Asthma. Both allergists, one from Aberdeen, one from Sioux Falls. Good friends, actually, and we appreciate their being here. Thanks Thank for you. having us. We are tickled to be here. So the question I'd like to start with really is the hygiene theory. You know, that's come out uh, as an explanation about the fact that there is so much more allergy happening nowadays over the last, you know, 30, 50 years, really, than before. So what would, uh, let's start with you, Mark. What is the hygiene uh, theory? The hygiene hypothesis is that uh, the more stuff we give our immune system to take care of with the germs and being sick, the less likely you are to have allergies. And so by cleaning things up, we tend towards the allergic side. And that's actually being seen with food allergy even, that the, our bacteria in our stomachs, in our intestines make such a difference. And which ones are there? Do we kill off the wrong ones with our antibiotics? Uh, and it makes a huge sway of going allergic or non-allergic. Think of our farmers. They have a far lower incidence of allergy and asthma than our city dwellers. And it's because they're exposed to all the dirt and the dust and the bacteria and that's and, right. And your body that good old cow stuff. That cow stuff. Yeah. Any any response to that? I mean, well, it's a, the the studies were just amazing because they started with German families who had this low incidence of allergy, and that's because their animals live basically just with their house, you know, you under the house to keep under the, the house, house yeah. right. Yeah. And dairy farmers were particularly low and what they found was there's a bacillus subtilis, which is in cow uh, manure, poop. cow or poop, and that bacillus subtilis is aerosolized and it stimulates Th1, which it, it doesn't mean much to you, but we have two arms and Th2 is the allergic arm and Th1 is the non-allergic arm that takes care of viruses and bacteria. Well, when you're taking care of viruses and bacteria, it tends to uh, make the Th2 side more subtle and not as reactive. And what Mark was talking about was they showed that peanut introduction in Israel is very early. That's what they have for their uh, teething babies, and they have a lower incidence of peanut sensitivity because they we think, because they introduce it early when the GI tract is ready to do that, ready to take care of that. So, I mean, we, knew, we need our immune system. I mean, it fights off cancer as well as infections and so on and so forth. But it's a different side of it that is the allergy part of it. I mean, what do you see in the future because of the hygiene theory? Uh, I, I really see it as administering the correct type of bacteria at a certain age, 
so that we can prevent the allergy or the asthma from coming on in the patient if at all. So exposure to certain... We're doing that now with peanuts. Uh, if you've got uh, atopic dermatitis, eczema type of stuff with your little kid, uh, especially if they have an egg allergy already, they're at high risk of becoming peanut allergic, and we know you give them the peanut, uh, uh, go down the GI tract, the tolerance is developed. And so there are certain bacteria that uh, talk to our intestinal immune system, and that makes such a difference with whether you're going to be food allergic. And so we could manipulate that. So, I mean, we're talking about the microbiome. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, this and whole the, microbiome yeah. of our so, body. Yeah. So this microbiome thing, you know, when you're a C-section baby, you don't get the microbiome because you, you don't go through the birth canal. Right. You don't swallow. So there are suggestions and people doing this that take the perineal fluid and administer it to the C-section baby, the mom's perineal fluid, because right. it's got the right bacteria, your perfect bacteria. Your mom's bacteria is your perfect bacteria, which lowers so your mom. incidence of allergic disease. Wow. And of course, you know, that, that baby crawling up on the mom over mama's belly and mm -hmm. finding the breast and suckling the breast and of course this sweaty, dirty mom, you know, who's been going through labor and that baby gets the microbiome of the mom and it makes that baby so much healthier. Makes them healthier. That birth canal is the, is the secret spot for them. Yeah. All right. But despite all this theory, it isn't 100%, right? That's correct. I mean, right. exceptions to all of it, and people who have no allergy background in their genetics will pop up with allergy problems. So we're still learning things. So we think sometimes that there are viruses that, that trigger. trigger that, like uh, monovirus is a disease of lymphocytes, the ones that are responsible for making antibody. So they get kind of goofed up when they get mono, because mono, kind of like chicken pox, doesn't leave you after you have gone through the mono illness. It's just controlled. It's within your body still. It's part of your microbiome. Actually. Yeah, um, part of your not cellular a, biome. Yeah, yeah, not exactly. a good thing. Not but good. I think the biome thing is a very important addition to what we're doing in in uh, medicine. I mean, they recently showed that prebiotic is probably a little more effective than probiotic because it's hard for the bacteria to get through that stomach realm, uh, which is so acidic, um, which is Kills not the off. realm. Kills them off. So if you take a prebiotic, it so makes what you grow already in your gut more likely to grow the right stuff. But explain to me prebiotic. I li yeah, you like lost there's me. one called inulin, and it's it, it. What it does is it provides a structure. It's a sugar. It provides a structure for the bacteria that you like to grow. Okay. In your in your intestine, and it makes it through the stomach without being changed okay. dramatically. All right. So, you don't s suggest going out and buying a bunch of prebiotic right now, but. Prebiotic is now included with probiotic as a kind of a regular uh, combination. And do you do you find a nature made or a brand over the counter? Over the counter brand. What is yeah. it called? The Culturel makes one. Uh, the one you just mentioned, Nature Aid. They're nature made. They all make them. It says on it pre and probiotic. Okay. And you recommend that particularly if you're going to be taking antibiotics. Absolutely. Antibiotic just kills no. your gut. But so does I don't think we know enough which bacteria to be putting in there. And right. then there's so many positive and negative counter studies on this stuff. I'm still not happy with which one should doing. I be recommending. Right. All right. So we have some disagreement, but that's, you know what, no. we can agree to disagree. I, yeah. Yeah. And I don't think we really hurt somebody. We don't have enough data to say, is it really worth spending your money on that, is what I think. Yeah, there you go. Well, it depends. I can tell you right now, I am on, I, I had an infection in my liver, so mm -hmm. I have a cyst that is with a catheter and that's draining a tube right now. So I am loaded with antibiotics. Mr. It. Conservative, yeah. don't prescribe antibiotics, and I'm getting them every day, and I, my, my, um, my microbiome mm -hmm. is going, ooh. <laughs> but you know, it's not just antibiotic that changes your microbiome. What is it? Well, things like Splenda. That changes your microbiome. To a good, in a good way or bad? No, not in a good way. So there are other things they're discovering that really alter your microbiome. So you have to be, 
you know, that healthy diet that you always talk about, yeah. it really is helpful because it does provide a better microbiome. The green stuff that we All those greens, you know, all those vegetables. vegetables. They have more than just the fiber in it. Yeah. There's things on it. I like that. You know, there, there is a lot of data about green salads that are way more important than we, we previously thought. Uh, eat your green salads, let's put it that way, <laughs> particularly if you're on an antibiotic. And be sure to wash your kale, because I guess they use a lot of pesticide or herbicide to oh, really? grow kale, yeah. That's I don't know of, anything, I don't like the kale. Be <laughs> careful though if you're tree nut allergic and you put some tree nuts on it, then it might be a problem. Tree nuts? Yeah, you know, when you have your mixed salad and we throw in our nuts and yeah, things I like, like that. that, and then you give it to the anaphylactically allergic person. So, oh. so it, all things have to be tempered. Yeah, you better read your labels too, because sometimes they put Those sesame in, in, in yeah. hummus. Sesame is the new uh, allergen. The new peanut. Yep, yep. yep. Uh, mustard and <laughs> sesame. Mark and I had that discussion, and I have mustard and sesame on my yeah. hip list now. A lot, a lot now. more people are becoming allergic to those too. Okay. So well, we're talking about, uh, let's talk about anaphylaxis. I'll give a story. I had a patient who was in the uh, Grady Hospital uh, outpatient clinic. He had a sore throat. The intern ordered a shot of penicillin for a sore throat, mm -hmm. quote unquote. You know, one of those, you don't do that anymore. And that's the last time that I think Dr. Bria ever <laughs> ordered a penicillin <laughs> shot for a sore throat because the gentleman was sitting that's outside. The nurse said, you know, you just sit right there. Well, the sh he knocked on the door. I don't feel very well. And then he kind of was going to pass out, so she sat him down on the floor, and he, he's sitting there, and by the time I got there, he was sitting there, and he's going, oh, I'm going to vomit, and he had a wastebasket, he grabbed the wastebasket, and he leaned forward to, to vomit, and then he just totally passed out, and he had no blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So he had an anaphylactic reaction, uh, uh, lost his blood, his veins completely dilated, and there was, uh, there was no blood pressure. So we, so what do you think we did? I hope you gave him epinephrine. That's exactly <laughs> what we did. Hey, okay. We gave him a huge dose of oxygen. Up, yes. I'm having trouble with my, my questions. I know we've got questions, but I can't see what yeah. they are doing on this tablet. So the problem child. It's a problem child. So for a, uh, a definition standpoint for our viewers, anaphylaxis is kind of an all over the body allergic reaction. You have to have at least two systems affected. So a lot of time, most people have an itch, but there's I can't breathe, their tongues or throat swelling up, uh, they might be vomiting, diarrhea types of things. And the big thing is the blood pressure going away. Well, right. and when it goes away and your heart doesn't have anything to pump, your heart stops. So you that's give a bad a, thing. You give them a dose of epinephrine and it just sits there because no circulation is happening. So you have to move uh, it around for them. Yeah, I've heard. And you gotta give it in the muscle. I've heard in the muscle, although one thing that we said when this man was totally gone is that one of the attendings said, maybe you should have shot it under the tongue because that then you could have gotten a better sh chance of getting into the circulating volume. <laughs> the guy did sur survive. Uh, we, we got an IV in, I don't know how, but we did, and we filled him full of saline water. Not a periosteal IV. No, and uh, we could have periosteal IV, which is into the bone, and in, in, uh, when that works, when nothing else does. Yeah. That's a pediatrician speaking. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, we're that's uh, you know, the, the issue of anaphylaxis. The take-home message is what? Oh, I, th there's so many messages, um, and and Mark has pointed this out a lot. He's he's done some work with anaphylaxis, and what what it is is you you need to have if you know you're allergic, you need to have your epinephrine with you. That's only a 50 percent thing. Yes. you should probably avoid it. That's probably only about an 80 percent thing. And then uh, uh, Mark uh, identified the fact that. 56% of the time, the person's got it with them, but they don't know how to use it. There you go. So they, they, they haven't been trained, or they don't remember, or whatever it is. And or they're includes, afraid to use it. Well, and there's somebody that's right here at this table that used an EpiPen and gave <laughs> the audience an absolutely excellent view of how it goes, and, and I, I use that. Yeah, you, you, you use that? I uh, use your, our video. your video. And your we will video. be seeing that. I think it may not be this one, it'll be the next one. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Allergies are a lifelong event. They may change over time, but you'll always have to be aware of their presence.
once I got old enough to realize that I had them and what they were, I actually had to ask my mom. I had no idea when they started, um, how we learned about it the first time. Mom just said that when I was a young kid, around the age of three or four, I always had issues um, around my dad, which my dad was a farmer, still is. Every time he'd come back in the house from being outside working around dust and pollens and crops and things like that, I would have allergy issues. So she uh, finally figured out some correlation there and went in and did an allergy panel, found out uh, a number of things that I'm allergic to. My mom figured out that I had peanut allergies and that's been the serious one my whole life. That's the one we worry about. The rest of them are just annoying. They're a nuisance. Two exposures that I remember uh, totally accidental, of course. One of them was a contamination issue that I didn't see coming. The other one, I was uh, eating a, kind of a granola bar and uh, so were some of my friends. And mine was a flavor I can have, theirs was a flavor I cannot. They look the same, the texture is the same. I accidentally picked up their bar, took a bite, and that was the first real emergency room experience I had with a peanut allergy. I didn't know how serious the onset of that was. It was very fierce, and my eyelids swelled open, swelled shut got really thick, my earlobes and the back of my legs started itching, I started feeling ind uh, indigestion, and I kind of panicked a little bit, um, but it was only a couple minutes till I realized, whatever this is, this, this is peanut, this is obviously coming on quick, I started to feel my airway get to be quite a bit restricted. So I was with some friends at the time and I said, look, you guys, we gotta go to the ER. We got to the hospital um, instead. I didn't have an EpiPen, that was really my only option. Once I got there, they took one look at me, got some epinephrine in me, Benadryl, nebulizer, this whole thing, and I spent basically most of the day there um, until that subsided. We just thought casually in seeing Doc recently for a physical that I had to have, um, he asked me if there's any refills and things, and I have asthma, allergy-induced asthma, so uh, an albuterol inhaler is something that takes care of the hay fever and the soy allergies and the things like that on the farm. Usually an, uh, uh, an inhaler is kind of my rescue there. Again, not as serious as a peanut thing, but he asked if I needed any more EpiPens. I'm like, yeah, I'll just throw that on the prescription. I'll pick up some EpiPens too. And I went to the pharmacy to learn that they're $723 for a refill on my EpiPens that I hope I never, ever, ever have to use. We have them now. Um, I, I don't have it on me now. I don't have it with me at work every day, but it's never farther away from me than it would need to be to get to it in an emergency. So I keep it in a travel bag with my bathroom toiletry things if I'm traveling, or my wife keeps it in her purse, which is always on her. So either I'm traveling with my wife or I'm traveling with my bathroom supplies. So they're, they're within arm's reach, but I've never had to use my own yet. So Clinton found that he needed to have significant help when he was exposed to his reactive allergen. One of those emergency treatments was the use of an EpiPen. They're easy to use and very effective. And here comes the demonstration. Do an actual demonstration. This is not a practice pen, this is a real pen. I'm not having an allergic reaction, but I'm not afraid of it because I know I've got good guys to protect me. But it's a safe thing to do even if you didn't need it, right? Exactly. I mean, this is a wonderful demonstration. So we, we should not be afraid to use it if we think we might need it. What, how would you might need it? it? If your throat's swelling, you're itching, hard to breathe, feel like you're going to throw up, any of those things are signs of an anaphylactic reaction. Particularly if you know that you've had a previous reaction or you know you've been stung and, and you know that there's something, I call it the feeling of impending doom. Yes. And you should do something. Something to do. So I, I'm having that impending doom. I was just bitten by a, a wasp or, I mean, stung by a wasp. Or I just ate a peanut and I'm in trouble. And I know that if I do this, it's not going to put me at risk. And if I don't do this, it's going to put me at great risk. So I want to do this. So this is, what you, this is the EpiPen. There's another product. They're both the same, right? 
Yep, right. They'll do the same thing. They'll okay. save so your life. Quickly, within a couple of minutes, help turn that allergic reaction around. All right, and then you get to the emergency room. Yes, right. you do. All right, so this is a real pen. I'm going to take it on, off the top, and I'm going to take bring it out of the protective case. All right, get rid of that. Throw that, the and then the blue pin comes out. The pen comes. The cover comes off. Throw it away. All right. It's fully armed. Fully armed. Now we're ready. You're ready. Put it on your thigh. I put it on my thigh through my clothes. Yep. Through your clothes. And then I'm going to push, I'm going to push it in and hold it for ten seconds. There you go. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Awesome. Oh, I could feel it. Way to go. It hurt a little. Not bad. Not much. No, it's a, just a surprise because you. Yeah. Not, and in a minute it. or so here, you're going to feel that your heart starts beating fast. Okay. And you'll feel a little jittery, like you just got scared at the movie theater. Or had way too much coffee. And or the, I was going to give swollen, a trumpet solo. The swollen throat, the itchiness is going to start receding. And you'll be feeling a lot better, and you can make your way to medical care now. Very good. Any, that's great. Thank you for providing us a pen and for being here. Well, thank you to for, wonderful for, uh, you for actually demonstrating it. That was that awesome. Was nice. Wasn't that fun? I thought I was a good example. You were great. Was great. Hey, hey, what thanks for showing, folks. Uh, yeah. yeah. This is your program, and your questions are key to the direction of our discussion. Please call in your questions to 1-888-376-6225, 1-888-376-6225, or send us an email to ask at prairiedoc.org. Well, we've got some questions. One viewer asks, what is the best way to avoid seasonal allergies? Well, I think that, uh, you know, again, the best way is to keep your windows closed um, in the evening. I mean, it's impractical to say that you stay in all the time. But if you're going to do an activity that's going to get you a particularly large exposure, wear a mask. And I have masks that I like that have a, a valve in them so that they don't get quite as, as warm. Anything else? I think the, if, if a person could take a little vacation uh, away to buy parts that don't have your allergen, that's fine. But otherwise, the house closed up, use your air conditioner. Uh, those things make a difference. Adding filters rarely clinically right. makes a difference. I so, mean, they sure mm. cost a lot and yep. they promise a lot, but they don't make a lot of difference. So instead, I'd like people to think about get ready with your meds, jump in with uh, the nasal steroid spray about 10 days before you know the season's going to hit. Take it every day through your season and have some fun with life. It's right. really hard to, to be a hermit. When, you, when you're all stuffed up and feeling bad. We have a question from Sioux Falls. So woman states, it seems like older people always have runny noses. Why would that be and how would we stop it? Well, the, the runny nose of Jo is a joy of aging. The joy of aging. The joy of aging, and um, it was fondly called vasomotor rhinitis at one time because they thought there was a vasomotor component, an, an autonomic component, a neurologic component, and uh, now we just call it chronic rhinitis, and it responds very nicely to um, medications that contain an atropinergic agent or atropine, so there's a number of prescription um, uh, nasal sprays that last about four to five hours, mm -hmm. Mark, maybe, that will cut it down. Um, it's not something that cures it, and uh, you just use it for times when you have a runny nose. And you know, also those people have trouble when they eat food that's spicy, and that makes their nose run. Right. It's called gustatory rhinitis, and we have names for that. But it's a type of uh, runny nose that we have a medication. Can for. it's a prescription? Prescription medication. What is, what is the Ipetropium. Brand? Ipetropium nasal spray. Ipetropium. And you know, the other thing is that we, we're kind of hoarders of diseases as we go along. And if you had dust mite allergy when you were in your 30s, you may have it when you're 80. The majority of folks keep that. And if you have some broken nose and the drainage isn't right, you're going to keep that going. And so then we have these other new diseases we get. And some people at 60 develop allergy for the first time ever and are now allergic to their 
dog or they're dust mites. So. so let's talk about dust mites. Now that's not a seasonal. I mean that's a kind of a year-round deal, mm -hmm. right? And Mostly. That, huh? Mostly. Mostly. It, there is a, a fall seasonality to it if you don't keep your house uh, dehumidified. dehumidified. So, But it does rise up, but it's all year round. And you know, it's really bug parts, right? Bug poop. Bug, bug poop. Bug yeah. poop. It's the waste of. product of the dust mite. Of the of that little dust mite. Dermatophagoides. Okay. He just likes to say that word. That's a, that's <laughs> yeah, a fun exactly. word for he dust poop. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, and the answer is to how do I lower the dust mite count in my house? Uh, move great, higher than a mile high uh, makes things low humidity. So we yeah, try to so have dehumidify the, helps. So humidity, you know, in the forty percentish range helps out. There are encasements for your mattresses and pillows. Do you think those uh, encasements work? There's a lot of debate uh, about that. I've heard. I, I'm not convinced that in South Dakota you can drop the dust mite concentration Count. enough. You can really work hard at it. And it might make a difference so that if you do the immunotherapy allergy shots and become less allergic, then you, it takes more of it to get you sick. Uh, and then some medication on top of that. But yeah. I really, the dust mite thing, it's the number one allergen in the world. So, and it is a very much a antigen that causes asthma or airway reactivity. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we should diminish how important dust mite is because I do have patients whose all their airway reactivity or asthma is based on their tremendous dust mite sensitivity, okay. which they, they carry that airway reactivity way past their exposure. They've shown that if you have injury to your epithelial, you remember that even when you've left the antigen. Right. So that reactivity, both in your nose, which started this was the vasomotor mm -hmm. rhinitis, well, that person could be allergic to something and that vasomotor rhinitis from going into Bed Bath & Beyond and I got my terrible runny nose right. may have the basis in allergy. So my thought is when people have what we think is the dust allergy, uh, I, I try to encourage them to not have carpet. And I try to encourage them to have a cleaning person come and clean really well when you're not, and you don't do the cleaning, and uh, and make make sure that the you know the curtains are clean and that your bedroom in particular is is dust free. Uh, I think it's important I, to know if you actually have an allergy before you expend all the energy and the cost. Uh, know what you have, and your outcome is going to be a lot better. And the way you know but, that is going to you, know, you get tested by your uh, allergist would do that. Your family doc may order a blood test that say, "Hey, is this the dust mite or is it my dog?" Otherwise, if you have a whole bunch of things you're testing, skin testing is going to be a lot less expensive and more accurate. Well, and dust, yeah, because one's a biologic test. You're you're pricking the skin right where the action is, those, rather than measuring what's in the blood, which is maybe high if you've had exposure, maybe not re indicative of what your daily activity is. So the skin prick test is a better deal. It is. Yep. And you yep. guys do yep. that. Yeah, we do. And you know, one of the things that you guys came to, I remember, I think it was two years ago, maybe three, when the two of you were on the show, we talked about the new study that really showed the value of uh, desensitization shots. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, it's it's so unbelievable. Even as allergists, we are amazed every time we have patients come in. And I mean, we have trouble getting people to stop their shots after they've shown appropriate response because they don't want to go back. Right. It's not the shots give them relief. It helps with the nasal, the asthma, uh, less sinus infections, ear infections, less expensive. So it's really helpful. And a viewer is wondering, is tenderness of the, excuse me, the sclera of your eyes potentially related to allergies? That's, you know, scratchy, itchy eyes. Is that a, a, a picture? You'd, you'd need to hear uh, itchy. You'd want to hear itchy. Uh, I don't think of so much the tenderness. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be a little concerned about tenderness. Again, you know, there's, uh, and, and sometimes people come to me and say, well, my, I've got this redness in the white part of my eye scleral redness and that kind of thing and a lot of times that is not allergy because there's no itch just redness and then you're thinking about do I have some pressure phenomenon or do I have rosacea or something like that so dry we eyes. do yeah dry, eye dry eyes. eyes that yeah 
We had an ophthalmology show a couple of weeks ago, but uh, I, I do think that people who have itchy eyes and a runny nose, mm -hmm. that indicates an allergic problem. Yeah, it's nice things. to have something else besides and just. both sides. Okay. Not just, Not one, just one eye. Yeah. So when you're having one eye and there's red and there's pain, mm. get thee to the eye doctor. Get yeah. thee to the eye doctor, yeah. Uh, a la Bolt, South Dakota. La Bolt, South Dakota, population 68. A woman uh, would like to address a weird allergy to birch pollen. It is a thin-skinned tree fruit. Can you elaborate more on this topic? Have you, either one of you heard uh, birch pollen allergy? Well, yes. It's relatively common in areas that have birch as their primary tree. It's a, and it has some cross-reactivity to other things that are out there. Yeah, and birch is pretty common. It's a huge thing in northern Europe, like <laughs> Norway. And The reason uh, we're smiling yeah. is because he's been to Norway. Yeah. And so. <laughs> uh, but it's a huge uh, thing even here in South Dakota. Lots of itchy, sneezy, runny, and a lot of folks with birch allergy have oral allergy syndrome, so they bite into their apple or some cherries and their mouth itches. They don't go on to anaphylaxis, but they're just miserable. If you cook the apple, you're fine. Oh, it's really a neat thing. Uh, uh, a neat right, thing? Well, right, well, from an allergist standpoint, it's, it's really, <laughs> yeah. uh, the science is phenomenal. Uh, ragweed does the same oral allergy syndrome with melons. Uh, really? So if you eat melons, it hurts? Yeah, it itches. itches. Itches your mouth. And it feels kind of puffy on the inside, but you, know, you don't get to the, I've I never can't heard breathe. This. So if you have birch tree allergy, you, you have. Might have an issue with apples. pears and apples. Mm -hmm. And so cherries. Now, so now the season, quickly, season, and we've got a lot of questions, so we've got to go so yep. very quickly. The season of allergies starting right now. And birch is one of the first ones. And it birch, has a little cat can trees hang down. Trees oh. in late March, April, into May. Trees, trees. in late April, uh, uh, March and April. And into then, May. And into May. Grasses start in May. The very end of it. End you of got May, a little break. especially June, into July is, is the grass season. And then the season for... The weeds, weeds start end August. of July, end of July, August, September. Hill right. frost. And mold is when we don't have snow. Yeah. And when we don't have snow, it's mold. It's mold. And, and you don't have a barn. Yeah, okay. That, that's your run. That's your run. <laughs> that's Next. Your run. A Redfield woman says she has never had allergies before. She spends a lot of time outside, but in the last five years or so, she's had allergy symptoms. Is it common to get allergies when you age? And I don't know what her age is. And I think you answered that the, earlier. The, yeah. For gals, uh, it's as they go along. Uh, little guys get it. The girls catch up later. And by the time we're 70, it's even Steven. So, so Sometimes around the 40s and 50s, especially right. for gals. And just for interest's sake, pregnancy usually causes TH2 allergy yeah. to be less because you're your immune system has a graft, that's the baby, that's yeah, half trying somebody to else, not, kick out the not baby. to kick the baby out, so that down regulates allergy. So a lot of times I'll have a patient who is seeing me as a teenager, has babies, I don't see them for a long time, they come back and see me in their 40s as they are about six to eight years from their last baby. Oh wow, that's interesting. Brookings woman asks, how do I know when it's a cold, not allergies? And I'll give you that same story today. Mm -hmm. Today, today, the day of the right, allergy. Right, right. <laughs> Suddenly, I wake up. My nose is just full. I'm sneezing a lot. I don't have itchy eyes. I kind of ache all over. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with this other thing with the liver. But the, the, something's happening because I've really got a lot of r r nasal rhinitis. And so we vote for rhinitis and rhinovirus. You think it's virus? Rhinovirus. And rhinovirus. Yeah. Rhinovirus. You didn't say itchy. Nope. You, you said achy. Allergies don't really give you achy. Uh, the proof will be that a week or so from now you'll be better. And uh, if you had allergies, it's going to go on for about three to four weeks because this is tree season right. and each of those pollinates for about three to four weeks and then they're done. Right. But now I'm seeing all of the snow mold. Explain to me what snow mold is. Well, underneath the snow is the grass and there's a natural mold that's commensal with the grass. And so as the snow goes, now it's exposed, it dries up, that's when the mold spores and it just needs a little bit of wind or you walking 
All you have to do is just walk over the grass and it puffs up. Okay. So basically it's just coming out, it's been hidden underground by a lovely snow. Oh, okay. So it isn't on the top of the no. snow, it's underneath. Uh -oh. Now there's no food in the snow. Is it safe to take over the counter allergy medicine every day and what are the best choices? The, everything over the counter used to be prescription. It's so safe that you can take all of them every day. Now so they say Claritin is weaker than Allegra and Zyrtec. Yeah, it's a little bit. Uh, so if one of those doesn't work, that means you need to go to the nasal steroids. The nasal steroids have to be used every day in order to work because it takes three to four days for the, the effect to even start up. And so the main mistake with them is only using them until you're better, then you quit and all your symptoms come back. And it's this <coughs> up and down, okay. miserable road. So you say steroid nasal spray for a week at least. Before. Before you're going to see What he help. said is if you know you're tree allergic, you should be starting it right now. Right. And, then and you should, it for when six you weeks. administer it, you should look at your toes when you spray your nose. Look at your toes when you spray your nose? Your nose does not go this way. Oh. It goes down. this way. Oh. So. so. That's all right. Uh, uh, is it safe to, so, uh, but what about Benadryl? Everybody Don't use talks Benadryl. About Don't use <laughs> Benadryl. It makes you Crabby. can't think. You can't think. And you're not, <coughs> not coordinated. There's a classic study. What, who drives the best? The drunks. They actually had volunteers that would get intoxicated to 0.08. Some that took Benadryl and others took Allegra, or Fexofenadine. And actually the drunks drove better than the Benadryl people. Don't take Benadryl. Yeah. Bad, and, and if you have an anaphylaxis, you take it, you go to sleep. I can't tell if you're low blood pressure or you're falling asleep because of the Benadryl. Avoid the Benadryl. And that's a national movement to use Cetirizine or Zyrtec instead for the, any of the itch stuff So in Benadryl. And spray Benadryl? How about topical Benadryl with cal calamine no, lotion? That's okay. It except it's sensitizing. And so you can become allergic get, to it. You, you, you can get, become allergic get to it. And then, rash. Yeah. You, then you get a rash, <laughs> the, a from, bigger from rash than they had before. But the basic thing is there are really safe, highly effective antihistamines that don't have the same side effects. Allegra, as, Zyrtec. Zyrtec. Yeah, Claritin, Claritin. Zysol, all those. Do those, they're, they're, they work just as well. Or and better. They, and, or better and they don't have the side effects. Yeah. No Benadryl. And if they don't work, then you gotta move on to the next treatment. Is it true that eating honey from your local area will help prevent allergies because of the pollen within the honey? Not proven. Disproven. Not proven. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I uh, mean, but, but having honey, honey is a good, a, a good source of sweetener, and, and that's a good thing because I'd much rather have you use honey than one of the artificial ones. Oh. For just your general health to be For your better. general health and probiotic wise, no right. harm there. No harm except in so we small like honey. babies. We like honey, but except for small babies. Don't give it to small, small babies because right. salmonella, low low dose. Botulism. Botulism. Okay. botulinum. I if I'm allergic to something, is it likely my kid might be too? Mark? The tendency to have allergy things, meaning allergy nose, asthma or eczema is inherited, but the which things you're going to be allergic to is not. It's more that you're exposed to the same thing that your mom would be exposed to. Oh, wow. So it isn't really an inherited thing. It's an exposure. That's a specific. Environmental thing. Yeah. You agree with that? Yeah. I mean, the inheritance is really not super well worked out. Yeah. It's a multi-allele kind of thing. And I, so I don't think the, I don't think all of the answers are in on that. But for the most part, it isn't a glaring, yes, boy, you're allergic and but so But boy, on. it's amazing how many families, you know, everybody's allergic to the ragweed <laughs> type of thing. And I've got some groups that three of the kids are allergic to peanut. And dad is too. So, so I mean, you're just countering what you just said. No, that's, those are small numbers. And when you look at bigger studies, they, they say the, it the dilutes it out. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> but I don't, if somebody Maybe comes in, the answer. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> And I, and I have a personal bias that I think if the mom's allergic, then we tend to have the k more kids allergic than if the dad's allergic. So there's something about moms. the mom carry kind of thing. We can blame we, moms more on that. No blame no, there. Don't, yeah. don't, don't blame anybody. Don't, nobody. Uh, so, but I do know this, that uh, people who have uh, asthma seems to run in families. No. 
Yes. Yes. But that's that whole airway reactivity and are you going epithelial damage and all that stuff. And so the there's asthma is uh -huh. the same genetics though as the allergy nose and the eczema. Those are the three legs. And as you go through life, you can oh, switch allergy. around which ones you have. Okay. Wow. What's the correlation between what the doctors previously discussed with nasal sprays, EpiPens, and asthma? Well, they have EpiPen should work for asthma, and it should work for... Uh, it would, yep. in an emergency. We in used emergency, to do that. Yep. Yep. And nasal sprays, I don't know where that is related except that... Most people with asthma also have that same swelling that's going on in the bronchial tubes up in their nose, and so it's real customary that if you have much for asthma, you're going to need a nasal steroid plus an inhaled corticosteroid for your lungs. Okay. Should people keep the EpiPen two-pack together, or is it okay to separate the two-pack, one for home and one at school or work? Probably well, together. Okay for both, but it's better together because sometimes you need two shots before you get to the They ER. say you give them the shot, five minutes later they're in the extremis again, give them the give second shot. Give that them again. That's why they put them together. Sometimes they fail, sometimes people grab them backwards, and you're you trying to thumb. hit your kid, and you stab it into yourself. You, now you can grab the second one, do it correctly this time, and save your kid. Okay. Into the muscle, right? That's what the shot is all about. Hopefully, hopefully into the kid to begin with. Into the kid's muscle. <laughs> the kid's <laughs> yeah. muscle, yeah. yeah. The, the patient. The An patient. Aberdeen woman asks, are emergency inhalers considered allergy or asthma treatments? Asthma treatments. Emergency inhalers. Yep. Asthma treatments. Although and we said earlier that an asthma inhaler, you know, a, a Alupen or something, may be helpful in a person who's having an anaphylactic reaction. Could, but, uh, Don't. And, and remember that probably 80% of asthmatics, allergy is a big part of why they have symptoms. And if you're anaphylactic and you're asthmatic, you're likely to target your lung um, as the organ that's involved. As a matter of fact, if you get a transplant of an asthma lung into you and you're not asthmatic, but you get a lung that's asthmatic, in your lung transplant, yeah. you'll have asthma. You'll get asthma from you the lung transplant. You bring that, that comes with it. Wow. Okay, quick, quick answers. What do you do with idiopathic post-nasal drip, Mark? Uh, the pro you, a lot of times it's the nasal steroid plus one of these other agents like the ipitropium or some azelastine combo is pretty common. All right. An Ipswich man says, my daughter is diagnosed with too many eosinophils and has asthma. What can be done through medication or diet to correct this issue, and can you elaborate more? Eosinophils, uh, very quickly, can you explain eosinophils and asthma? Eosinophilic asthma is a type of asthma. It responds very nicely to steroids, so inhaled steroid is our first line of therapy with eosinophilic asthma. Um, and the eosinophils just represent an allergic right. process. Right, and, and, and you could be allergic also, and that's why you have the eosinophils. Some, some of the worry might be if you have a lot of per, uh, in your blood eosinophils, <clears throat> I'd worry that it might not just be asthma. There are some other diseases that also look that way. Now, a uh, fungal disease called aspergillus has that. As okay. A, a trip woman says, when I'm exposed to mold or dust, my joints are sore the next day. Could this be an allergic reaction? Oh, oh, oh. No, it's not different. It, it's different not immune allergy. System. It's a T cell. Yeah, yeah. And it's different side of the yeah. immune system. Not, not allergy. Okay. Sioux Falls man says, as a youngster, this person had rather severe asthma, but now does not have asthma anymore. So can asthma go away? Yes. Yes, asthma. it can. And, and it can come back. And it can come back. And if you measure how twitchy the airways are and somebody who says that their asthma has gone away. They may still have it. It's yeah. usually still there. Yeah, a little methacholine. Test will show that. that. Yeah, exactly. I read about a procedure called Clarifix, nasal cautery, which could, uh, delivers cold temperatures in the nose. Is that effective for the chronic runny nose? Clarifix? Either I do one? not know. Have you heard I've of it? I've not seen good studies on that. Okay. Beers for a Beersford woman says, I'm highly allergic to animals. Are there shots that someone can take to resolve this? The yes. answer is yes. Yes, the answer is yes, and so and get to it. It does not work if you do it under the tongue. They, we can't get it that, done that Good way, point. but by shot, yes. How do allergies affect COPD? There's a crossover syndrome, and 
that can be very important and is often overlooked because it gives you both, you've got your chronic obstructive disease and then you have airway reactivity, that's not a very good combination because you're already compromised. I, I think there's a lot of people who may well have asthma as a younger person and go on to COPD, mm -hmm. and, which is mm -hmm. emphysema really. Uh, and they may not have been a smoker. Agreed? You agree? Agreed, but you don't have to smoke very much if you tend to be a person who has asthma. airway inflammation. It makes and it a lot it's worse. It's going to be more of the bronchitis type rather than the, emph uh, the emphysema okay. in those patients. If you've got asthma, stay away from the cigarettes. Flandre woman says when she eats avocados, gets a severe stomach pain and cramping. Can this be cause for an allergy? Avocados. Yes. It could be. I would. I, I'm still looking for itching. You look for other itching. symptoms. Other, other symptoms, symptoms uh, other than just the tummy ache. Yeah, uh, food allergy could... almost always has multiple places that it's showing up. Hives. I can't breathe. My throat swollen. My tongue is big. But okay. intolerances are ones where you, every time you eat it, you don't feel good. So, so that's an the treatment for that is don't, don't eat, eat it. it. <laughs> if you're allergic, one to it woman asked. Don't, don't, don't eat it. Yeah. <laughs> one woman asks, while uh, a while back, I had a severe anaphylactic shock to antibiotic, and since then, I've been terrified of all drugs and reluctant to take anything. Most physicians don't seem to understand my fear. How do I best communicate my worries to them? I think actually just talking with your main doc is really helpful and people underestimate the anxiety, the fears that people having have. a bad anaphylactic reaction. It's close to a third of patients get a, a form or a, a degree PTSD. of PTSD. Yeah, exactly. post traumatic so stress. So get an syndrome. epinephrine pan and, and move on in life. Sioux Falls Man, we got two questions. Sioux Falls Man asked, is there any way to overcome an allergy to the flu shot? Yes. It, okay, and that means, and then the other question is, is there a connection between migraines and allergies? Higher incidence of migraines in allergic patients, just barely. But allergies don't cause the migraine, but when you're sick with your allergies, any kind of headache is worse. It's a reasonable trigger. All right. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question, true or false, nasal washes, cleanse allergens and irritants from the nose, true or false? And the answer is true. Any comment? It's true. It's true. And I'm not sure who answered the question correctly, but we will get a book to you in the mail at very soon, as soon as we can find it. Oh, it was Francis Nuzma who, who, hey, North Dakota, thank you, Francis, and we'll get a book to you soon. We'll be right back after this. For more than 16 years, the Prairie Doc organization has endeavored to enhance health and diminish suffering by providing useful information based on honest science in a respectful and compassionate manner. Prairie Doc physicians and health professionals continue to answer your questions each week, creating a vast Prairie Doc library of medical information available to you and your family 24 hours a day. Make sure you don't miss a thing. Follow the Prairie Doc on Facebook and YouTube for free and easy access to the entire Prairie Doc library. Ms. A was in the bagel shop line and told the server she was allergic to peanuts. The server reassured her there were no peanuts in the bagel, but was unaware some peanut butter was left on the knife from an earlier sandwich. After a few bites of the bagel, Ms. A Face and lips started swelling. She itched all over. She slipped off her chair, vomited, and fell flat, losing consciousness. When the ambulance arrived, the emergency team kept her flat, gave an IM injection into her thigh muscle of epinephrine, also called adrenaline, and then took her off to the hospital. Anaphylaxis is a severe allergic reaction that can follow exposure to an allergic trigger and will happen in the lifetime of one or two out of every 100 people. Symptoms are secondary to the release of histamine and other mediators, causing a severe drop in circulating blood pressure. Triggers can be from foods such as peanuts, wheat, nuts, shellfish, or milk, an insect bite or sting, a medication like penicillin. The, the full list is long. Aside from avoiding the trigger in the first place, the single most important treatment for anaphylaxis is epinephrine, 
which is a hormone released from our adrenal glands. There are few reasons not to give an injection of epinephrine if there's a chance that anaphylaxis is happening. Our bodies make natural epinephrine when we are faced with fight or flight situations. Antihistamines like Benadryl and Claritin and others have no role, no role in pre prevention or treatment of anaphylaxis as they only help the itch. The single treatment for anaphylaxis is epinephrine, period. Have an injectable epinephrine available or near persons at risk and use it if even worried. To obtain a self-injector of epinephrine, you need a prescription. There are now five types available and they all work pretty well. Ask your pharmacist to get you the least expensive one and be sure you know how to use it. The price for a kit with two auto-injectors runs from $375 to $600. The cost to the manufacturer to make one auto-injector was reported as under $30 by the NBC News in 2016 after a U.S. House Committee looked at the price of auto-injectors. I believe excessive markup of the prices of medicine by drug manufacturers is unethical, and we need to pressure our national legislators to do something about it. Patients with anaphylactic allergies must know what to avoid. Have epinephrine available when, uh, and use it when necessary. And after any reaction, they should see their provider. Ms. A recovered fine and never went without her epinephrine rescue injector again. Remember, you can follow our discussion and extensive library of past subjects on our internet sites, either prairiedoc.org or our Facebook page. This is in addition to the radio programs and newspaper articles that are available each week. Well, a big thank you to our guests, Mark and Tom, for once again volunteering to come to our studio in Jaeger Hall on the campus of South Dakota State University. Their extensive knowledge and genuine friendship helped make this program successful. Thank you, gentlemen. Absolutely. Go girls. Go guys. Go girls. Go girls. Tomorrow night. That does it for tonight from all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. During the Civil War, with every three soldiers killed in battle, five more died of disease. We'll look at the progress we've made since then. Medicine at War, next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. For more than a decade, Dr. Holm, in his role as the Prairie Doc, has emerged as a leader of healthcare education and communication in South Dakota and across the country. Every week, Dr. Holm and other medical professionals volunteer many hours to share science-based truth about healthcare on public television, on the radio, in our newspapers, and online. And best of all, everyone has free, easy access to the entire Prairie Doc Library. Hi, I'm Jennifer May of Rapid City. As a board member of the Healing Words Foundation, I ask you to consider making a donation. Please help us continue this important work. Go to prairiedoc.org and make a donation today. Thank you. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support on-call television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. Brookings Health System. Ophthalmology Limited. Avera Heart Hospital. 
Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Urology Specialists, Brown Clinic, American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation and South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Black Hills Medical Society, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Third District Medical Society, Seventh District Medical Society, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, and Swiftle Communications.